so yeah, it's a pleasure to have our next speaker, Yash Kanoria, is also a colleague from Columbia University uh, at the business school. And uh, he's also apparently at Amazon right now. And uh, uh, he will talk about dynamic spatial matchings today. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to this wonderful workshop. Thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah, so I'm on sabbatical. Uh, so though my home is Columbia right now, I'm at Amazon for a year and it's quite fun. So I'm doing supply chain optimization there. Uh, somebody asked me, what's the connection? Are you using this in Amazon? Uh, this is a hard question. Uh, <laughs> Maybe in some indirect way, but uh, this uh, this work actually. So for me, it's it's uh, it's uh, close to my heart. It goes back to things that I've been working on in some form for more than a decade, uh, not continuously, but in some form. Right? It's been sort of gestating for a long time. So I'm uh, excited to share where we've gotten with this. This is work with my esteemed co-authors. Uh, Yilun Chen was a postdoc with me, and he just started as a faculty member. Uh, at CUHK Shenzhen. Uh, Akshit Kumar is a PhD student at Columbia, so he's a main person driving this agenda forward. And Omar Bezbez is a colleague at Columbia. Okay, so um, uh, th there's a number of applications that motivate this uh, type of study. One uh, set of, uh, so, so one, one sort of whole bunch of inspiration is coming from ride hailing. You can think of this as dynamic matching in typically two dimensional space and the supply and demand both live in this two dimensional space. They will come online, uh, both sides come online dynamically, they're matched, they go off and do their thing. Next set of demand and supply come in. Uh, so this is sort of dynamic on both sides. Uh, you have a number of other matching platforms that also serve as inspiration. Uh, here you can think maybe the supply is coming in uh, beforehand, it's more of a, a, a sort of static thing and the demand comes in dynamically and needs to be matched. The space here, so if you think of a lodging kind of setting, uh, the space uh, for, for the supply units might correspond to their location, to the size, to the amenities, the price and so on. So there are dimensions for each of these different attributes. And the demand has also, the demand units are these customers, they also have preferences over these different attributes. So they also live in a, a, a space with the same number of dimensions. Okay, so we will uh, talk about a model later, which will be inspired particularly by these types of matching platforms, Airbnb and Upwork uh, kinds of uh, platforms. Uh, and I come from operations. So network revenue management is this, this whole set of problems. And traditionally we've been thinking about models where there is a certain small number of supply types and the, or, or resources and a small number of demand types. Uh, and we let the number of customers uh, scale up, but keep those number of types small. Uh, increasingly, this may not be a good model of things that are actually going on. Uh, so now I'm at Amazon and our customers are in tens of thousands of different zip codes. They have, may, may have other dimensions of heterogeneity as well. Uh, so you have many, many types and you want to be able to say something about uh, how to do your, how to make your decisions in, in that type of situation as well. Okay, so at a high level, the, there are going to be two kinds of questions. So one is how large uh, are the costs that you have to bear uh, that arise due to the spatial heterogeneity, right, and demand uh, and supply, as well as the uncertainty about the future that is inherent when you have to match dynamically. Static matching, we know how to solve, right? But dynamic matching, you, you kind of, you, you have some forecast about the future, but you don't know exactly what's going to come in. And it, it's also an algorithmic challenge. Okay, so that brings us uh, to this, uh, the second main question, which is how to do the matching uh, in, a, in a dynamic setting. So we are going to focus on scaling behavior of this matching cost. It will be related to matching distance. Uh, we are going to look at the scaling behavior with the market thickness as a function of the dimension D. And I will not be concerned with constant factors and so on for the theoretical results. This was uh, just at a very high level. So I'm going to be talking about uh, basically these, these three pieces of work. 
uh, a sort of high level differentiator of this first paper that i'll talk about is that it's it's a it's supposed to set some theoretical foundation and we're going to assume that the demand and supply spatial distributions are the same okay so the only thing bothering us will be the spatial stochasticity and this is where the costs are going to arise from as well okay there's going to be less of an algorithmic question there though there, there is there is some algorithm that I'll, I'll need to use to be able to get positive results but it's more about just quantifying this, this these costs that arise as a function of the nature of the dynamics and the number of dimensions and then uh, we have a couple more pieces of work which are getting closer to to specific application domains where in particular we will allow the distributions the spatial distributions of demand and supply to be different from each other you can try to model certain aspects of uh, applications first we'll talk about matching platforms the other one is going to uh, come from revenue management so let's dive into the first paper here uh, and by the way i haven't put a huge amount of material so please interrupt me we can have a discussion and uh, i'll take questions throughout the talk Okay, so a, a sort of a gentle warm up. We are going to have supply and demand located uh, in the unit hypercube in D dimensions, and uh, we are going to assume that uh, these are are uh, coming from a uniform distribution. And in particular, we notice that this distribution is same for supply and demand. Right? We are going to try to minimize the cost, which is the uh, expected average match distance. Okay, this distance. Uh, it, it, let's let's think of it as the Euclidean distance. Any Minkowski dist distance is going to behave the same because we won't care about constant factors. Okay, this uniform distribution assumption is easy to generalize, but right now we are assuming that the two distributions are the same. Okay, so we just had lunch. So now let's uh, let me throw a riddle your way. Yes. Yes. Uh, so it's, so not asking. asking what does this cost? All right, that's it. Yeah, we are going to have online models, but this warm up right now, the first question I ask you will be a static question. Yeah, but, but the interest is in uh, dynamic models. The static models are studied in the 80s and early 90s, and there are some classic papers about it. So, you just try to catch up a little bit with that static intuition. So, the question is the following. If I have n supply units located IID uniformly in, let's say, two-dimensional space, right, in this uh, two-dimensional square, and I I don't reveal the location of that supply, I just say, hey, here, here is a demand unit. What is the expected distance of the nearest supply unit to this demand unit? And in particular, what is the scaling of this nearest supply unit with n? It, is it one upon n? Is it one upon n squared? One d one by one n. One d. Yeah. One d is one upon n. Good. <laughs> yeah, 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 perfect. So uh, good. So the answer, uh, Sanjay got it right. It's one upon square root n. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because it just spatial balls and pins, right? It just. Dropped. It has to be worse. Then. Yeah, why not? Be like it. Yeah. Closer than like one d, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Annoying with this idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Like, how can it be one upon n? Yeah. Uh, it has to be larger than one upon n. So now we are asking for proximity along two dimensions, not just one dimension. And in particular, it's one upon square root n. One way to see it is that if I have a ball with a radius one upon square root n, the volume of that ball, meaning the surface area here, is one upon n. And that's the volume that I need in order to have right. order one points because the density is n. Okay, so in 2D is one upon the square root of n. In D dimensions, by analogy, it is one upon the dth root of n. Okay, we cannot do better than the nearest neighbor, the nearest uh, neighbor uh, uh, in terms of our match cost. But when we are matching, we actually might have some conflicts, right? So these two uh, demand units here. They both have the same nearest neighbor, but they cannot both be matched to the same nearest neighbor. So the match cost might actually be larger than the nearest neighbor. 
And this gap is actually potent, even in a scaling sense. In one dimension, the minimum cost, uh, the minimum cost matching actually has a one by square root n distance, whereas the nearest neighbor is order one upon n away. Okay, the reason for this is if you take the left half of the unit interval, uh, it will have a stochastic excess or shortfall of square root n points. Right? So I have to go square root n points away to find the match partner. So this causes this distance to blow up by a factor square root n. Okay, so this is this is one uh, reason that this nearest neighbor distance may not be achievable. In this case, it's not. But we will think of this as one very simple uh, sort of benchmark to keep in mind. And we will compare what we can achieve with this nearest neighbor distance. Okay, so this is why I've introduced this quantity. There is one more complication because we will have dynamic models of matching. This complication is that we have uncertainty about the future, right? So this demand comes in. Let's say the demands are coming in one at a time and you have to match them immediately. That supply unit will go away and cannot be used for future demand units, right? So these are my supply units right now. So who should I match this demand unit to? In particular, would you prefer A or B to match this demand unit to? There's a few more to come. Yeah, so, so this A is, uh, so my transitions are not, or maybe the circle is just not visible, but A is closer than B. So the greedy algorithm would have picked A, but maybe I want to preserve A for future because I might have some demand which comes uh, in the left bottom left corner and it'll be much better of saving A to match with that uh, demand unit. Okay, so I might match with B right now. Okay, so there's, that's a reason that I may not even be able to get down to the static matching cost. Okay, and it's also leading to an algorithmic question of how to do the matching. Okay, that algorithmic question is going to be a little bit in the background for the first part of the talk, but it is there. Okay, so we are going to have, uh, so this is supposed to sort of set up some foundation, right? This, this initial model, it's not meant to be applied. It's meant to set up a theoretical foundation. So this uh, paper considers three models. All of them have some commonality. The supply and demand live uh, in the D-dimensional unit hypercube. They are IID uniform. Uh, the cost is always going to be the expected average match distance. They're going to differ basically in the nature of the dynamics. We want to see how the dynamics actually affect us. The first model is going to be just a slight extension of the work going back to the 80s and 90s, where we are just looking at the static matching cost in space. Okay. So we will have N demand units and N plus M supply units. This excess supply, M greater than zero, is where we have an extension over the previous work. It will tell us how much does this matching cost actually, matching constraint, bother us. Right? To what extent are we get able to get close to the nearest neighbor distance or not if we don't have any uncertainty about the future? The second model will have demand coming in dynamically, but the supply will be there beforehand. Okay? In all other ways, it's identical to the static model. So now we'll get a sense from this uh, to what extent does uncertainty about the future make us incur more cost? Okay? What's the best cost achievable here? And the third model will have both sides coming dynamically. And subject to that, it's going to be the simplest model that I could think of. So that simplest model will have at any point in time, little m supply units around in the system. And at every time one demand unit will come, you need to choose whom to match it with. They leave and then one supply unit will come at some independent uniformly random location. So I call that the fully dynamic model. Okay, so now the next uh, part of my talk, I'll just be telling you what are the results that we get for each of these models. So just to summarize, to give you a preview of, of what I find. So this, this matching cost, right? It has to be at least the nearest neighbor distance. This is not math, by the way, this is some cartoon. Uh, it has to be at least the ne nearest neighbor distance. The question is to what extent does it become larger because of the matching constraint? The answer we find is it's small except in one case. And to what extent does it become larger because of the cost of uncertainty about the future? And we find that is it's small in all cases. Okay, and by small here, I mean something specific. It doesn't change the scaling behavior with the market thickness. Is scaling? 
So these are uh, this n and m, uh, and in this case, a little little n. Okay, so some some thickness parameter. Is the cost of greed also small? Or uh... yeah, so the algorithm that I will show this for uh, is a variant of VD that I am able to analyze. Uh, there will be a, a case where we have a logarithmic gap. There's one case in which there's a log factor gap, or other cases it's a constant factor gap. Uh, I think that the upper bound is loose, and you need a more sophisticated algorithm than VD to uh, to close that gap. Okay, so with that caveat, VD is enough. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's another uh, quick summary of of uh, the results. So on the left, we have the static and semi-dynamic models. So one nice thing is that they are in the same column. Okay, so that semi-dynamic model, the uncertainty about the future doesn't bother us. So the results are the same. Uh, for one dimension, that nearest neighbor distance is not achievable. We already got a preview of that in the static matching, right? Uh, just in the in the initial warm up. So that's not achievable. But everywhere else, you can actually get down to the nearest neighbor distance up to a log square root log factor in two dimensions, up to a constant factor in higher dimensions. This fully dynamic model where both sides are coming in online, uh, we can actually get down to the nearest neighbor distance even in one dimension. Okay, so this is something cool to look forward to. Uh, why is this the case, right? Why does this 1D case not bother us? And this actually looks like the 2D case here in a certain sense. Okay, the uh, sort of applied insight that one can try to derive is where is excess supply helpful to you? Now, if you have already gotten down to the nearest neighbor distance, even a linear excess is only going to give you a constant factor improvement in the nearest neighbor distance. So you don't really need excess supply if you want to, you can't improve the scaling behavior. Okay, so excess supply doesn't help. But in the 1D case, because I'm actually incurring a cost much larger than the nearest neighbor distance, excess supply can help me get the cost down. And this is the phenomenon that is helping us here is that uh, excess supply helps to smooth out fluctuations, stochastic fluctuations in the quantity of demand at larger length scales. It's not that it's bringing the nearest neighbor closer, it's smoothing out that left half of the interval, the total amount of demand will not exceed the supply. And that is, that is the source of the benefit. In the fully dynamic model, uh, there is a more sort of uh, a, a mundane kind of phenomenon there, a pedestrian phenomenon, which is that if I have more supply units just hanging around, then obviously the nearest neighbor distance comes down and I can get close to that new nearest neighbor distance. So excess supply helps. So, yes. Yeah. Did you already say how M is the nearest neighbor distance? Like, is there, are they both, like, the excess supply? Are they yeah. So this, yeah. So the, the first two models, the capital M is some arbitrary non-negative thing, which is sublinear. It shouldn't be more than linear and it shouldn't be more than a multiple of capital M, but it can be any scaling with capital M. But like not a constant, it has to go to infinity. No, it can be zero. I mean, uh, okay. Yeah. And the last uh, The last one, uh, that is the scaling parameter. The little m is the scaling parameter. The, the horizon shows up in a secondary way. So I'm kind of hiding that. Think of it as what is the steady state cost? So you need some minimum horizon for the results to kick in, uh, but I'm hiding that. So what do you mean that both sides arrive dynamically at the time? Like they arrive M at the time? So M are there. Let's say I initialize the model with M at IID uniform location. And then a demand unit comes. And then you have to choose one of the supply units to match it to, and then they leave, and then a supply unit comes. So again, I'm sort of back, I'm back to having M supply units in the system. And this keeps repeating. So just this, like if I apply this, I ignore the part of the special part and apply the matching Ah, so you're saying I should I mm -hmm. So I, okay, so I, I will uh, I will uh, let's talk more about this offline, but I very specifically will use a spatial structure 
right i mean if you want to ignore you should do greedy i mean at least you should do something greedy like if you just start well, matching like a, is it like yeah. because it will get much better there and is considering the spatial like what's the like no the spatial the time space is already continuous right it's not even clear <laughs> they was a formulation to apply an online algorithm anyway let's talk okay. more about this offline see my comment is is that the, this the using the spatial geography uh, is very central to understanding the cost and getting near optimal cost behavior so somehow like is using some black box thing uh, i am very doubtful that it can be helpful here so let's talk more about it. Yeah, and the other dynamic or are they synchronized with dynamic? Meaning, yeah, like they come together or independent? Like, yeah, so I could have done that, but that would have made my life harder. So, somebody else can have... Yeah, so this is taking me away from what I was interested in. So, I, I just completely assumed it away in the way I set up the model itself. There's always M supply in this instance. What's the last year's? At each time, you have one uh, supply and one demand. Yeah. yeah. So two people are ever each time. Yeah, yeah. So that is by design of the model. You can study other models, but like you do it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have a question actually. Yeah. That is not my question. <laughs> so can you go to your results slide? Uh, so just yeah. make sure what. I mean, the theorem will come up. I mean, I haven't even begun in some sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just make sure I get it right. So what you're saying is. The red thing, delta, and we are not achievable. Once you have n, you can achieve it. That's what you're saying, right? Uh, once you have excess supply, and capital, M. and it's it's like uh, so. If you need linear excess if you want to get down to this oh, scaling. Yeah. You need linear. So if right. you have more than square root, you can start improving upon the case without excess. Okay. Uh, and I mean, you can you will get one upon the excess uh, as the thing you achieve. So we have a thing. Uh, so it's going to be that for excess, you will get down to one upon capital M. I have one more question. The right column, I did not understand. Uh, what you said about the so you said that N reduces delta and so delta and beer was this fundamental. Okay, this hold on. Okay, uh, we will come to this. This is uh, there is some asterisk to even uh, say what is delta and beer in that setting. So just give it this hold on for a second. Yeah, I think for this audience, it's too much introduction because it would be more concrete. Uh, this is more like an econ talk. So. Okay, so we are. Uh, so there's a very rich set of papers from the 80s and early 90s on static uh, spatial, random spatial matching, uh, which is uh, which is certainly serving as a foundation here. Uh, in terms of online algorithms, Shaw's thesis actually has some gems. Uh, and and uh, that served as a big inspiration. Online wind packing, uh, also spatial matching and stuff from that. Uh, that's from that region, I'm sure. Uh, recently, there's been a, a, a bunch of papers inspired by ride hailing, which says I need to maintain some excess supply. Right? Elon uh, has one of those papers. Uh, I need to maintain some excess supply so that when a customer comes in, there is some car in the vicinity that is okay. Uh, and I don't have to match them to the somebody at the other end of town. Uh, these are basically some reduced form uh, style models where they don't actually uh, model the details of matching and, and how the state changes and all of this. Uh, this paper uh, slightly, slightly uh, predates uh, the one I'm presenting, and they study the one dimensional semi dynamic model. I will be specific about what the results they found. Uh, in that case, excess supply. But that's the only case where excess supply helps. So we have to be careful uh, in interpreting that case. OK, so now uh, let's, let's dive into the models and results. The first two, we are going to have the same results. Okay, So the first one is a static model. And we will see what's the role of the matching constraint. <laughs> excess supply. So the model again, uh, I think by now we are quite familiar with the model. The N plus M de demand unit, a uh, supply unit. N demand units, everything is present beforehand. And I just want to quantify what is the uh, the minimum cost achievable. Right? It's not an algorithmic challenge. Like I know how to do matching right, efficiently. Question is, what is this minimum cost achievable? How does it scale with N and M? Okay. 
So these are all things known beforehand. Uh, this is for the case where there's no excess supply. Okay, so folks work very hard, especially for the 2D case, for three and higher dimensions. Telegram has a much sharper thing than what I'm showing here. He's, he's characterizing it uh, quite closely. I think the thing to note here, uh, the thing I want you to take away is that for two and higher dimensions, you're getting down to the nearest neighbor distance, uh, barring the square root log n factor in the 2D case. Okay, that one is somehow the most interesting and we'll see why later in the talk. But mathematically, it's sort of the most delicate. Uh, the 1D case, you do not get down to the nearest neighbor distance. It's almost as bad as a 2D case. Okay, so my first job was to extend this to the case of excess supply. Okay, so theoretically, not the, the hardest thing to do, but uh, I was able to, to get this extension, uh, which basically says that in the 1D case, if I have the excess supply uh, beyond square root n, I actually get the benefit and the cost goes down. Okay, and eventually it's down to the nearest neighbor distance if I have linear excess supply. Yeah. So what's the intuition for t? Okay, we will come to the intuition. The, the, the point is that you can get down to the nearest neighbor distance and higher dimensions. Uh, okay, so we are going out of order, but, but yes. Uh, <laughs> so in higher dimensions, the surface area is of, of a ball is quite large. Uh, I mean, as the radius of the ball grows, the surface area grows faster than the square root of the volume. Okay, so, so and in 2D, it's the, it's the boundary case where it grows at the same rate and that's where things get more complex. Okay, so that's really what differentiates D less than 2 and D greater than 3. Okay, so bottom line, that matching constraint was only potent in one dimension and excess supply helps you overcome that. Now we want to understand the role of uncertainty about the future when you have dynamic arrivals of only the demand side. Okay. So that is our semi-dynamic model. The only change from the static model is the, <coughs> the demand units. The demand units come in sequentially and they must be matched immediately upon arrival. It only makes our problem harder. I think we need to be careful on how to match as well, even in order to get the positive results on the cost scaling. Okay, this theorem should look familiar, not because you read it, but it's just visually exactly the same. It's only now it's a theorem about the, the new model. Okay, so the content is in the upper bound and we are getting exactly the same upper bounds apart from constant factors. Okay. So the, the bottom line is that you have to pay only at most a constant factor inflation and cost uh, uh, to even though you have uncertainty about the future here compared to the static model. Okay, so the so, so there is an algorithm which enables us to prove this stuff, uh, except for d equal to two, we are using a variant on greedy. For d equal to two, this will lead you to have a root log n gap uh, so we use some other, we, we sort of uh, use an existing algorithm from uh, Holden, Perez, and Zai, it's called gravitational matching. But I think, so, so now Akshit has come up with a few different ways of proving this upper bound, but none of them is greedy. You, you cannot uh, use greedy. Is it known that if you use greedy, you'll just strictly worse? Or is it more... uh, for, for my variant of greedy, I show that. Meaning I can prove that you'll do worse. Oh, okay. uh, for greedy itself, like, uh, where is Eric? So ask Eric if he can analyze greedy, then maybe he can tell you that it does work. But he has analyzed it for one thing. Okay, so uh, I don't know how to analyze greedy. <laughs> okay, we're going to see Eric's result in a second. So uh, what was known before, so the in the 1D case, the 1D semi-dynamic case, uh, with no excess supply, it's obvious that you will have at least a one by square root n cost. Right? That's true even for the, the static problem. And uh, there was this, this paper which had just come out uh, where they, so Akbarpur, uh, Ali Mohammadi, Lee, Lee and Saberi, 
So what they showed is that with linear excess supply, you can bring this cost down to uh, at most log cubed n upon n. Right? And this is what uh, Eric and co-authors actually improved to one upon n uh, last week. Okay, okay but uh, so, so what we showed is that you can actually get tight upper and lower bound uh, for this one dimensional case uh, as a function of m. Okay, it's a visual representation of the theorem I just showed you. Okay, after at, at a certain point, excess supply actually helps you bring the cost down all the way to the nearest neighbor distance. And then uh, two and uh, higher dimensions as well, uh, we have tight bounds, basically the nearest neighbor distance for all of these cases, barring some square root log factor. Okay, so as I have more dimensions, my cost does go up because I am looking for proximity along more dimensions. Right? So for any fixed M, I'm, I have a sort of, as D grows, I, I do have to incur more cost. 1D is the only case where I start at a point which is much above the nearest neighbor distance and excess supply is needed to come down. In all other cases, I don't actually benefit from excess supply. I'm already at a low cost. This third model, this was uh, technically like uh, pretty challenging. Uh, so this is where both sides are going to come in dynamically. Uh, and we'll see a remarkable uh, phenomenon, right? Uh, somehow that 1D aberration is going to go away. Okay, we will not now have this aberrant case where different, uh, where you have a much larger cost in one dimension than the, uh, the uh, na nearest neighbor distance that comes up. Okay, so this uh, again, our, uh, uh, our model uh, has the same dis spatial distributions. Uh, this time we are going to maintain little m supply units in the system at any time by definition of the model. Uh, and the, these challenge is going to be that when I match a supply unit, that supply unit disappears and the new supply unit comes at a uniformly random location. But my state is not m iid uniformly located supply because what's left is a function of how I was doing the matching in the past. So this distribution can get skewed and this can inflate my costs going forward. Okay. So what is the meaning of nearest neighbor distance here? Because I don't even have a handle on the state. I mean, that's the thing I struggle to, to do and, and to prove things, right? But we're going to just take an optimistic nearest neighbor distance. So I give you the superpower that you can reposition all supply units at every period before you see where the demand unit is coming in. So maybe you'll put it at evenly spaced locations or some, some even smarter version than that. And how far apart will they be? That grid will have this granularity, which is one upon the dth root of little m. So certainly I cannot do better than this. How close can I get to this? That's the question. Okay. The first result is that in one dimension, you can't get down to one upon m. In fact, you can't get down below log m upon m. This actually is by reduction to the two dimensional uh, spatial static matching problem of Ajtai, Komlosh and Tushnari. Because we start getting a sense that somehow this time is acting like an additional spatial dimension. Right? So we have a lower bound, but there's only a log m gap between that and the, the nearest neighbor distance. Is it tight? The question is still open but you can actually achieve log squared m upon m. Okay. I've shown that there's an algorithm which gives you almost the nearest neighbor distance in one dimension for long enough horizon, right? Okay, so let's not focus on this, uh, this little thing. Uh, for d2 and higher, you can get down to that optimistic nearest neighbor distance to within a constant factor. Okay, so somehow the d-dimensional case in this fully dynamic model is acting like the d plus one dimensional case in the static model. Okay, I won't go too much deeper into this, but time gives us, we can do some averaging over time now in this situation where both supply and demand are coming in dynamically. Do you think you can use that coupling to get the supply and log over the right so I think log m over m is the right answer. Uh, it shouldn't be obvious to you at this point, but I, I, I don't think it should be. But yes, uh, I think this is the right answer and I don't, greedy cannot get this. Like I'm, all, I'm sure greedy cannot get this, but uh, I think greedy gives you log m with the three halves. 
uh, at Google login square. But I think there's a different algorithm which should come from some of short bin packing idea. It manages different length scales and allows for cancellation in between them, and that should uh, make this achievable. Okay, hard problem, but nice open problem. Ah, yeah, 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 perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. so this scaling uh, just turns out it's problem. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. This is all for uh, uniform distributions, right? Yeah. Is, is there anything at all like known for more general, like even some of these cases, like uh, more general distributions? So the distribution density is bounded below and above by some constant. Anything sure, applies. Sure. Um, but in terms of the nearest neighbor, like the expected nearest neighbor distance. So again, scaling will not be affected under the assumption that I described. Okay. Because that's a constant factor. Sure. Okay. That's that's what I can say right now. If you have these tails and stuff, then that will change. So hopefully, the nearest neighbor distance is something you can get a handle on, and then hopefully the translation there will be similar to what we find. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, when you said that it behaves like uh, d plus one dimension, time is extra dimension, because the scaling one over n power one over d looks like what it was in the Yeah, so, so you've uh, mapped it in a way that doesn't work. Uh, I think, so this, if you think about where, in what situations can I get down close to the nearest neighbor distance? I mean, there is going to be a distance on the time axis, but that doesn't contribute to our cost. So at that point, the mapping doesn't work. There, it's, it's also don't take it too literally. Like this is the closest. The, the formal connection is only this lower bound. I'm actually, <coughs> using the two D lower bound, two D static lower bound to do this. Other than that, it's some intuition. It's not a perfect analogy. Um, yeah. Uh, it's like I have the motivation of a rider uh, sharing systems. It's yeah. like is the is the supply the uniform distribution of supply optimal when the demand is uniform? Like what would be the optimal supply distribution? Yeah, I think that's close to. I mean, uh, even if you have surplus like this, have. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, you want to make sure that it's well spread out. You have to have a spread. So let's say. I want to make sure that my pickup distance is small. So somehow the relocation of supply should be such that the distribution like over some time horizon should be the distribution of the relocated uh, position of the driver should be the same as the demand distribution up to that those pickup distances. And then, so that is just like, uh, just to maintain the steady state. Now you also want to keep a little excess everywhere. So you want to dynamically manage and make sure that there are cars in all neighborhoods. Like this is actually important. Uh, yeah. Couldn't there be some boundary effects in this yeah. case? I'm mean, like with boundary less like speed or whatnot, like yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So these things are probably going to get washed away in the constant factors. Uh, if you like tourists, you can think about the tourists. <laughs> Yeah. I think about the modeling. So yeah. you have this N guys that are just sitting, right? Yeah. I mean, I know you're matching the, the say, flux, but the M people that are sitting. Yeah. So instead, you could have a dynamic model where uh, you could do some kind of matching. So you wait until you have hundred people, then you match and keep repeating it. Well, yeah. So this uh, batching, so if I have a batch which consists of only order M demand units or fewer, then the scaling results are unchanged. So your batch size will have to be larger than the number of supply units sitting around. This, by the way, is not the regime for uh, for normal ride hailing. Like maybe for uh, like this ride share, which now is not very popular right? after COVID. But when you want to pair customers, then they might make you guys wait for longer. But the regime is not that you make people wait for so long that the pool thickness increases enough to change the scaling. I mean, that's a lot. It might change some constant factor. Uh, yeah, I guess that connects up with some of our conversations. Is the independent arrival solution question? Independent locations across time? I would think yes. Uh, yes. I mean, you will need a lot of correlation again to change the scaling, but yeah, if it's there, then it's a problem. Okay.
okay, so I'm going to give a, a quick set of uh, intuition. I want you to focus on the picture. There's a bunch of text. Uh, I think with the time that I have, I want you to just focus on the pictures. So, so where is uh, where are these results coming from? Okay, so this intuition. Uh, this is how I think about these problems, and I think you can try to get some of this even if you missed some of the results I was telling you so far. Think about the static model or the semi-dynamic model. What we want to do is to understand what's happening in D dimensions at length scale L for every L, starting from the nearest neighbor distance and going up to the uh, macro distance. Okay. So for any L in this, this interval, I can look at a unit hypercube and I can ask, what is the uh, how large can the stochastic fluctuations in the amount of demand in there be right and uh, if let's say i have no excess supply that stochastic fluctuation can go against me and it might be i have more demand than supply here how much more it's square root of n times the volume okay some basic calculation uh, and if that's the case i need to go outside to find enough supply to match all the demand inside how far outside so that's like surface area times this delta uh, times n. This should be the amount of excess demand that I'm compensating for. Okay, so I have to compare the square root of the volume and the surface area of this uh, side length L hypercube. And this tells me how large the delta can have to be. I call this the barrier to matching at length scale L. So you can compute this as a function of this D and as a function of L, right? And uh, this picture basically tells us what's happening. On the x-axis, I have this length scale L. On the y-axis, I have this barrier to matching. Right? In 1D, the macro barrier to matching is the most dominant one. So what do I need to do to match those in the left half of the unit interval? That's what my, my main challenge is. In 2D, all length scales have the same barrier to matching. It's of the same scale, uh, same, same order. So that's where these funky logarithmic factors show up, the square root of log. Uh, that's where greedy fails. It doesn't take into account con cancellations between different length scales. For three and higher dimensions, the nearest neighbor distance, so the micro length scale is the one that dominates. The hardest thing is to find the nearest neighbor. Uh, other length scales don't bother me. Some of the surface area of, of larger balls is large enough that I just go a little bit more and I can find lots of options and, and figure things out. So this isoparametric type of thinking is, is actually, for me, very helpful. Okay, and this type of thinking also tells us what's the benefit of excess supply. It kind of gets rid of the problem at the larger length scale because it dominates the stochastic fluctuations at those larger length scales. Okay, so this, this is uh, the intuition that I wanted to make sure I convey. Uh, in the fully dynamic model, somehow time acts like an additional spatial dimension. So even the 1D case acts like the 2D case in the pictures that I showed you. And we don't have this problem at the longer length scales. The algorithm is a, is a that, that I've used to prove most of these results is a variant on greedy that I could analyze. So it consists of basically taking the unit hypercube, subdividing it, uh, into child hypercubes by cutting each side length in half. And you keep doing this until you get down to the nearest neighbor distance length scale. Okay, and then you try to match within the same leaf hypercube. But if there's no supply, you go up to the uh, one of the sibling hypercubes. And if that doesn't work, you go up to one of the first cousin hypercubes. So, so you're kind of decomposing this way the cost across the different length scales. And in fact, the cost at each level of this, this uh, hierarchy is of the same order as the barrier to matching at that length scale. Okay, so that, that's pretty much the intuition for the semi dynamic model. Uh, for the fully dynamic model, it's a little bit more involved. So, in some sense, the intuition behind barrier to the dimension is hmm. like the increase in the objective with, with the amount that you have to relax to make the constraint, like that conversion is. They, they, they will give you the just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. From constraint to Yes. I think that's, that sounds like good intuition. I would have to think a little more, but it sounds like.
Yeah. Uh, Ilan has this nice paper where they kind of assume that the nearest neighbor distance uh, is achievable in 2D, something like the fully dynamic model. And we have shown that actually that's the case. And so now it sort of makes it even more solid that uh, this is how you should do your capacity plan, okay, which was the point of that. Okay, so bottom line, we, we understood well here the case where the supply and demand distribution is the same and the nearest neighbor distance is almost always achievable. Okay, so now we want to take this and, uh, and move forward. By the way, there are nice open problems here, uh, which I will skip over for now, but happy to talk about these offline or maybe tomorrow if there's room in your, in your session. Uh, Definitely. Yes. Okay. There are many open problems. Yes. yes. Okay. 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 So now we want to understand uh, something closer to the application. And one key difference is going to be that demand and supply distributions are not same, right? So we will look at uh, look at uh, application motivated models, uh, which have this feature, and also will allow the match cost to not just be the distance, but maybe some power of the distance. We will see that the power two comes up naturally in one of the models. And this already basically eliminates hierarchical greedy as a candidate because it's matching some people at long distances and not paying a heavy price. So now it's not going to give you good scaling behavior. Okay, so we will look at the, there'll be two papers that I'll breeze through now, and both of them will be the semi dynamic model, which I think is more, more relevant except for ride hailing. Uh, ride hailing, I think the equal distribution thing is not too bad. Okay, so we, we talked about why a little bit, but for other applications, I think the semi-dynamic model is probably closer to the reality and we will be looking at P equal to two, it'll turn out. That's what comes out naturally uh, in these slightly more applied models. So first uh, let's look at uh, a model inspired a little bit by matching platforms. It's going to have smooth spatial distribution, not the same as each other. The match value will be the inner product uh, of, of the demand point and the supply point. And uh, we will now need to really think about how to do the matching. You can't do it greedily. It's going to give us very poor performance. So this is inspired. This is with Yilun Chen and Akshit Kumar. Uh, it's inspired by these matching platforms. So let's think of uh, lodging, right? So you have listings, they have some attributes. Let's think of two price and distance to downtown. And let's say the customers have sensitivities to the price and to the distance to downtown. Okay, and each customer has their own sensitivity. Let's model the match value as the inner product between the sensitivity vector and the attribute vector. Okay. Once you have put in this minus sign, you want to maximize this, this inner product. And this maximizing this inner product in a setting where I have N demand units and N supply units, no excess supply, is equivalent to minimizing the squared distance. So a simple calculation. So, so we are back to minimizing distance, but now we are minimizing the squared distance. Okay. There's no reason demand and supply distributions should be the same. They even have different interpretations. So we will allow these two to be different. So does this max mean also when you approximate? Uh, when you approximate? Like so let's say now we turn it into a maximization question. Yeah. And we have a two approximation, like you get one half of all. What does that imply for the minimization? Uh, that... So I'm not, I'm not looking for approximation. Okay. Uh, I, will be, I will be looking for uh, the additive regret. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Also, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The reason for the square, as well as mathematical sort of cleanliness. And the square seems like a somewhat random. Uh, so this, uh, the inner product, they use this in recommendation systems. Like in the theory that has been developed for recommendation system, they will use this inner product utility. Sure. So then the square comes out from that. Uh, it certainly helps us, right? So one of the open problems is going to be what if it's not two and some other power and we don't know how to handle it, but we don't feel too bad about the inner product. Okay. 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 Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So now uh, all of us are sleepy. So one more riddle for you. Uh, so I have a demand distribution, which is uniform between zero and half. 
and I have a supply distribution, which is uniform between half and one. So what is the optimal transport, which will maximize the expected inner product between the demand point and the supply point? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Java has it right. So it's just taking each point and matching it to half plus that point. Now, if I use a greedy algorithm, and by the way, uh, sorry, yeah. yeah. What are the vectors? Okay, sorry, I'm going to So it's a 1D case. It's a 1D case. So the vector, it's a scalar. So I'm just trying to maximize the average product between the demand location and the supply location, or the demand value and the supply value. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned it's a one dimensional case. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I understand. I think uh, I was yesterday at uh, UIUC at this workshop and one of my co-authors gave the post lab stock and I slept through early half of it. <laughs> <laughs> you are on camera, by the way. <laughs> no, I mean, she saw me, so I think it doesn't get worse. <laughs> um, okay. So this is the, this is the, uh, the optimal transport. Now, if you think about a, a actual matching platform, which doesn't do the match like Airbnb or Upwork, they are trying to give each person like the best quality recommendation. This is as though they are running like Netflix, right? That they can Netflix can have the same movie watched by everybody, but these guys have a matching constraint. But like their default is they will just make recommendations without looking at the matching constraint. So this means you are doing a greedy match. You are doing a random, uniformly random matching. Uh, effectively, if your demand is coming in in a uniformly random order. And in this case, there's maybe a 10% gap. So it could be a 50% gap. Okay, I won't claim more than 50 because I haven't checked, but it can be a pretty big gap. Okay. So we need to use the optimal transport and stuff I'll not cover now, but uh, Elon and Axis have done a great job with it. There are two other key elements that need to go into an algorithm which can achieve uh, the right regret scaling and, and the, the optimal regret scaling and regret here is how far I fall short of the fluid optimal transport value additively. So these two other elements, they, they call it symmetrization and online fair allocation. So this means that their algorithm for identical distribution is doing a much better job than hierarchical reading. It's matching everybody to somebody close by as opposed to matching some people at a distance. I won't go into uh, what they have done. But bottom line is that they are able to probably achieve the best uh, regret scaling. And by the way, this thing is like the square of the nearest neighbor distance, except in the 1D case, where is the square of that other quantity that came up, the one by square root n. We're getting basically the, the same type of result with, again, those same uh, those caveats that uh, Anupam brought up. We are not able to do this analysis for p not equal to two. A nice problem. Uh, we are not. Able, we don't know even algorithmically how to proceed when there's excess supply, and we need this fair matching type of thing. Nice problem. Okay, I don't even know how to, to approach it. I don't even have a heuristic. Uh, and then for these platforms, they need to decentralize the solution. They need to know how to make recommendations. They don't control the matching. There could be incentive issues. There could be other kinds of issues. Maybe the customers have choice probabilities. Uh, very nice, I think, question or set of questions there. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about revenue management. So this is work with Omar Bezbaz and Akshat uh, Kumar. So this actually is also, it can be viewed as a semi-dynamic uh, model uh, question, but now, in, in revenue management, right? It's as though your supply distribution is atomic. Okay, and uh, we're going to see what if your demand distribution is uh, is smooth, like the kind of distribution we've looked at so far, and what if it's lumpy? Okay, and, and we are going to come up with a new algorithmic insight to solve uh, the problem when the demand distribution is also lumpy. So, so uh, Okay, this is the so this is the multi-secretary problem. Okay, so I have uh, a sequence of n secretaries with abilities drawn from some distribution f, and uh, each time I have to make an irrevocable higher or not decision, and I have a capacity 
of the secretaries I can hire. I want to get the largest sum of uh, abilities right, in the people that I hire. Okay, so the standard, this is a, it's a revenue management problem. The standard policy is certainty equivalent with resolving. Okay, so this is a special case of optimal transport, but you recompute it after each arrival. To see how much budget is remaining, how, how many people are going to come in, you recompute the threshold. So there's some threshold. Uh, so this, this is known distribution. Known distribution, yes, known distribution. Okay, so this is uh, this is going to give some constant or logarithmic uh, uh, regret both for atomic distribution as well as for smooth distribution, like uniform zero one. But the one of the first things we show is that if you have a continuous distribution but with a gap like this, this regret of this policy can be square root n. So even optimal transport is resolving optimal transport is not enough. It was enough if you had a smooth distribution of demand, but only the supply was lumpy. It had atoms, but not enough when both sides are lumpy. And we introduce a, a principle we call conservativeness with respect to gaps here, which basically says that if my threshold is close to the gap from the optimal transport, and I, I compute that there's a risk that I will hire some low value secretaries. And in future, I will have to turn down some high value secretaries. Let me avoid this risk. Let me just use the gap itself as a threshold. Let me reject low value secretaries as long as this risk persists. So this is important and we are able to get the optimal regret scaling in various, uh, under, under various sets of assumptions. Uh, that uh, was what I wanted to say. Uh, there are some open problems here as well. Most importantly, the multi-dimensional version of this. Multi-secretary is a one-dimensional problem. Uh, and Aksid has been working hard on this. Maybe this is uh, this warrants more than one paper. Though. It's a hard problem. Okay, so just to just to wrap up now. So we uh, we've done these scaling characterizations. This is a regret. We are able to bring it down to the nearest neighbor distance in uh, all except that one aberrant case. We gave algorithmic insights, and this actually there's a sort of nice high level picture forming as well. If you have different distributions of demand and supply. You cannot use greedy. You need to use the optimal transport. If both of them are smooth, you can use a static optimal transport. If it's like revenue management where the supply distribution is atomic, right? But the demand distribution is smooth. You can use a dynamic optimal transport, the resolving certainty equivalent policy. If both sides are lumpy, you have to use an additional this conservativeness with respect to gaps type of thing uh, that, that we found. Lots and lots of open problems of both theoretical as well as applied interest. Okay, we survived. End of the day, though. I mean, end of talk. Thank you. You mentioned, you mentioned about uh, the other thing I can think of is just distance, but it's of two distances. It so, um, it's a constant factor for any thing. Uh, so it's time. constant that depends on T, but even elements of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't care about the constant dependence on D. Uh, I mean, I do, but uh, that was one of my open problems. So I think. Uh, I think that you should be able to get down to within one plus little o of one of the nearest neighbor distance in high dimension. Okay. Because you just need a little more, that shell has so much volume, it should be enough. Thing. So nice open problem. I don't know how to do it. And that is what you meant by the sharp characterization. Yeah, yeah. So in the static thing, he's able to analyze it. The dynamics of I don't think he knows either. You know? I got much of the inspiration from this was like various email conversations with Tabellan, but I don't think he has any idea how to do that. So I know it's okay. We take a short break and see upstairs for second question. We begin at topic C30. Uh, but those who have posted earlier and said. <laughs> <laughs>